Hello and welcome to Simplified. My name is Gurjot. And my name is Michael. And this is episode 3. Hey there, this is part 2 of this episode. You can find part 1 on our website. And now, let's begin. If I try to create an analogy out of it, tell me if it's correct. You're just randomly throwing balls at a wall and you see at which point when the ball hits, the ball retraces the farthest or like the wall does something. And then you look at, okay, so when you hit the ball here, this happens. And then you write reverse engineer that thing and you focus on that bit. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So as I said, there are two approaches, right? <laughs> Hypothesis trim and unbiased. So for the unbiased approach, you don't need to be smart, right? You just like, you just... <laughs> You know, if you can ask the right, if you have the right system to ask the right question, right, you just let, that's what I meant, the animal tell me what it is, right? So that's why it's just the randomness, like, you know, sh just shoot out and then whatever, like, filters out. And then just see which one lives the longest. Exactly, right? Yeah. It's just, this is the read at. And you need to, of course, you have to do that in high throughput, right? You go millions and <laughs> millions of animals through, right? They have a couple of them that really, like, fit what you're looking for, right? And then for the smarter part, it's more hypothesis trim, right? Um, you could look at this, uh, what we're doing actually, we look at these centenarians mm -hmm. and now uh, we're looking at those gene expression variants, right? These associations, right? And then we try and um, to, to test those ones directly. Either we, we generate the mutation with CRISPR Cas9, which is the technique uh, we're using, or you could uh, use RNA interference, which knocks down the mRNA of, of those genes, right? And then we lifespan the animals. And, um, and th that's actually how we read that. So for basically what we're doing, right? We, we find the hypothesis or the actually guess in those variants, and we say, okay, mm, that gene variant affects a pathway that could Effect like you know health and, and things like that, and then we need we need to do all this genetic engineering. And when I say we, at the moment this is Alina Teuscher. She's a graduate student in the lab, and she does all the the manipulation there. And then to test the lifespan, um, this is done by Siri Stotzer. And the way we do it, we do it in an automated fashion. So since this is CTH, right? We're trying to build <laughs> cool machines. That can do like uh, a lot of things, and so we have a machine. We building, so he's building at the moment a machine. It's called the uh, Lifespan machine that was developed by Nick Strustrup at Harvard Medical School. Okay. And basically, what it is, these are scanners that can modify it. And where on the scanners you can put the plates with the worms on it, and it, the scanner takes a scan every hour for three weeks, right? Right. And then we let the computer analyze automatically the scans. And when the animals stop to move, we call it dead, right? Mm -hmm. And so intervention <laughs> that makes the animals move for longer, meaning they're healthier yes. or live longer, we can like, you know, filter out and figure out, okay, this gene association or this gene variance actually influence the rate of aging. And then we're trying to figure out the mechanism. Mm -hmm. So what what needs to happen to maintain uh, a healthy animal for longer. And so that was the work I started at Harvard Medical School where I just basically asked, again on the gene expression level, what happens with those long-lived animals compared to the normal lift, right? And so things came out like they're better protected against the oxidative stress response. So f uh, uh, oxid uh, you know, things get oxidized that damage your proteins or your DNAs, right? And then pathway or mechanism is also important for like protein folding and, and, and get rid of the DNA damage and maintain things for longer. And the new thing that um, I or we found out that time is that cells not only um, invest in protecting like the proteins and organelles that are inside the cells, but also outside the cells. And this makes kind of sense because we're multicellular organisms, right? right. You have like <laughs> billions of cells, right? You don't want to only like, if you want to live longer, right? You only want to protect the things that are inside the cell, but also like 
things that hold the cells together on the outside in the cells. And so that's actually at the moment the main focus of the lab because most of the studies have been really focused what's happening in the cells and refocusing what happens with the connection to the cells and how they hold in place. Like to make it more collaborative with other cells as well? Um, yes, so that and um, also it's, it's like a framework that holds everything together. So things that um, uh, the organs be functional, things like that. So in a, on a technical aspect, you said you look at uh, sequencing millions of genomes. And so does big data play a role as well now? Because you have to do s handle so much data. Yeah. So, so machine learning also comes in here. Exactly. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't do the sequencing and I don't do, uh, so we're trying to do a little bit machine learning, but um, we don't do the sequencing. So other people are doing this, right? Mm -hmm. They're really good at, as I said, Craig Winter. And yes. then I don't know if you heard about, um, yeah. Yeah, the other people uh, mm -hmm. doing these. But then in the end, you have to, no matter how good your machine learning is, you have to test it somehow. Now, once you pinpoint the genes that make life longer on these small organisms, how do you go from small organism to mammals and then to humans? Um, so, you ask me how I do it personally? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, okay. <laughs> I can, so, so um, yes, so once we identified, say, a gene or mechanism in C. elegans, um, trying to, like, um, to test those same things like in cell college or in mice, right? And at the moment, um, our lab is really focused in the things that are outside the cell. It's called the X-cell matrix, right? And here at ETH in the department I'm in, um, they're great experts in the X-cell matrix, right? So, um, for example, I mean, for example, we have um, Ralph Miller, um, Marcy Tsenobi Wang, Catherine Wirtz, Viola Vogel, or Jess Niedecker that work on, different, um, on a different level, but also kind of related to Excel matrix. So whatever I find some mechanism, I can go to them and collaborate with them and try to test it even further. So I'm still on doing the basic research, right? Once that mechanism is established also in mammals, right? Then you're trying to move this up, say, um, at to, uh, at to the clinical level. So here at ETH, um, we have really strong connections from the University Hospital Zurich, right? Mm -hmm. And then we have this VIS translational center here in Zurich, which is also very cool. It really helps you to push the things further, right? To develop strategies, like some therapeutic strategies. And once you have really good strategies, you could think of um, starting to do a startup company, which again, ETH has a fantastic yeah. environment. They have a great tech te transfer office and they have like almost, as to speak, like a pipeline, right? From mm -hmm. like the, the, the pattern, the ideas to really like start doing this. And then um, I think this, the, the startup space really developed here in, uh, in Zurich. So as I said, like coming from Harvard Medical School, where there are lots of startups around, it's very vibrant, and I have the feeling it's coming here too. And say you get to that far and everything holds so far, and then you may get you know, the big companies' interest like Novartis and, uh, and, and other companies like these um, that really develop the product further. So from, from the discovery to like the bed, the whole process, it's very expensive, so it can be <laughs> one, one billion um, Swiss francs, right? Okay. So there are lots of steps and there's lots of help. Uh, you need to get longer steps and there's a lot of failure rate. Right? So, mm -hmm. but um, I think here there's a really good environment to really help you like start from the basic science to have expert to help you like really develop that to really something good and then move it up to trying to translate it and then hopefully try to build, uh, bring it to the clinic. To make real world applications. To make real world applications. And so it's like a very, um, yeah, it's very, you know, it's, yeah, it's really like making an intervention, right, from, from, from the beginning. And that's mm -hmm. what you need. We need something new, we need something creative, right? And, um, Apart from aging, are there any other implications or applications of the research that you do? 
Um, well, application in sense like um, like. So when you find a certain pathway or a certain mechanism in a gene or an organism, is it only restricted to aging, or do you also somehow accidentally find the cure for cancer or something yeah. like that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay, so I haven't said that in the beginning. So the idea to do aging research is exactly to prevent these age-dependent diseases. So, for example, when we become older at the age of uh, 65 or older, all those age-dependent diseases like cancer, cardiovascular problems, diabetes, so Alzheimer. So they become really frequent. Yeah, become really frequent. So age is the main driver for those diseases, right? And then there has been a study we're um, trying to figure out, like, so now we could eliminate all cancer, okay? Mm -hmm. So every cancer we have, we could eliminate, right? And then they calculated it and they found out, well, if you could eliminate all cancer, that would merely increase the lifespan or the health span by three years. Wow. And, and you think, like, why would that be, right? <laughs> and then you realize that, okay, the, 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 the patient would be actually cancer-free, but would get Alzheimer or diabetes or other things, right? So there's a real comorbidity of all those diseases, right? You, you can, I mean, that's the strategy we have done before. We cure one disease after the other, right? Which is a very valuable strategy. But in parallel, I think it's very important to find strategies that, like, push back these age-dependent diseases, right? And so that's actually the basic idea of aging research, which is not to live up for hundreds or thousands of years or be immortal. The idea is really like to push back these aging diseases. And then again, you think, well, is that the, just a pipe dream or could that be something real, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can look at uh, centenarians again, right? They live a very long life and most of them, like 45% of those, they really push back those diseases. So, in the end, they're like a couple of uh, months or half a year, they have a rapid decline in health and then they die. Or 15% of them never see an age-dependent disease, right? So this is really like the goal we're trying to drive into. Just okay. delay the diseases so people can live longer. And healthier, healthier. Long, longer, healthier, right? So mm -hmm. you really like disease-free. I mean, the goal would be, say, you 80, but your organs are like of a 50-year-old or something like that, <laughs> right? So you like, you, 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 you know, you, there's a good life quality. And so this is also the idea, the department here at DTH, the part of health science technology to really like prolong the, the quality of life for longer, right? But you said, so these centenarians, they live healthily and then suddenly their health degrades. Yeah. Is it the case that with normal people, their health just degrades gradually over a long period of time? Yes, so, yes, so there are different, so, um, there, there are different levels to it, right? So some people are very unlucky and they get age dependencies very early, but it takes decades, right? Alzheimer's disease takes decades, right? right. To really go and then um, it's just, and then there are other people that are very lucky and they live up to 90 years, for example, and then it's just a very short period of time, everything starts to disintegrate and fall apart, right? Then it just uh, depends on the disease specifically? Uh, n no, it depends on aging, right? Yeah. It depends on aging. So even like with the little roundworm C. elegans, you can have the genetics the same, the environment the same, but still one worm lives to 15 days and one worm lives to 30 days, even though the genetics and the environment are the same. And that's what I meant with randomness. So there's still some mm -hmm. randomness into it. Randomness can also mean things we don't understand, yes. right? And so <laughs> once we understand what drive those differences, right? Understand the basic process or the molecular mechanism underlying this, we can start to tweak those or, or like push them like the way we would love to have them. So is it a legitimate concern that if you keep on increasing longevity of human life, so we know humans didn't used to live till 80 as we do now. They only used to live at 30 or something. Yeah, 100 so years ago. Hundred years right? ago. Yeah. So it's, it's very recent that <laughs> we doubled our lifespan, right? Yeah. So is it a legitimate concern that the longer we live, the more diseases we'll have to face? I mean, is uh, from what I know, cancer wasn't a huge problem un until 100 years ago, yeah. because because we never lived so long to develop cancer. So if we, right now we live till 100, yeah. and if we live till 200, there'll be mega cancer. 
n new diseases, new maybe? Diseases. Yeah, we don't know yet, I guess, right? And that's where and the randomness comes in. Yeah, well, I mean, let me put it this way. So to understand that problem, actually, you have to look at evolution, right? Mm -hmm. And natural selection. So meaning that um, genes that are good when you're younger, for growing, right, and reproduction, they might be bad when you're older, right? And the reason is because evolution or natural selection doesn't care what happens to you after you reproduced. Because natural selection is, you know, favoring the fittest. Yeah, and yes. fittest means not the most muscles, the fittest means to reproduce the most or most successful in reproduction, right? So whatever gives you some extra gain when you're younger, right? To develop faster, you can reproduce more, right? Those mutations or those genes are favored in selection, right? And once you pass that age, past reproduction, it's just that could be also that gene could be good for you when you're younger, but could also be bad for you older. But selection doesn't care. So that's what we mean. <laughs> that that's what the intervention we're trying to do at the moment. We're trying to kind of correct those kind of things, right? That uh, that go wrong when you are past the reproduction day, reproductive age. So increasing the human lifespan from 30-ish to 70-ish, pharmaceutical and medicinal research played a very important role because we came up with vaccinations and lots of medicines that could help prevent these diseases. Do you think aging research, as you do and your colleagues do now, will that be the next step from pharmaceutical research? Or is it so strongly correlated that whatever you find makes it ways to pharmaceuticals and then they come up with better medicines that will... Is that how it works? <laughs> oh, well. Um, it, yeah, it, it could work this way. Okay. <laughs> um, the main motivation to do this, this research is really like, it's also very um, socio-economical burden to the younger generation, right? So um, you think about just one disease like Alzheimer's disease, right? Um, the U.S. government, for example, spends $144 billion a year just treating the disease. Not in research, just treating the disease, right? Okay. And then 70% of that money is spent in the last year of the patient just to keep him alive. Uh, so you think about how much money is just like, you know, is spent, which is, I don't want to say that's wrong, but it, it's a good thing. But if we could do something to improve the health, we could save a lot of money and we could use the money for something else and it would be less a burden to the younger generation, right? Like to focus on prevention as opposed to curing. Uh, exactly. Which or like, would be much cheaper if, yeah. if it's just prevented, right? Yeah, so okay. if you could like postpone all those <laughs> the age dependent diseases, that would be um, yeah, much better for everybody, right? Um, I and think that's the main goal. I mean, people are not trying to live for I mean, at least I'm not trying to live up for 200 years. I think, <laughs> think 90 would be perfect. And as long uh, as you're healthy. As long as I'm healthy. <laughs> like 90 years and then a short decline for a couple months. And then uh, <laughs> no cost for anybody else, I think. And it's important to live to all the stages, right? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, after a certain time, so when I was 20, I had certain things that we like to do. Now I'm a little bit older. Um, <laughs> These things don't interest in me as more, much more because I've done it already, right? Yes. So there are next challenges, right? So you want to really live through all the stages, so right? Social philosophical concerns also come in the older you get. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's like, I mean, if you ask people, we are like they're around 80, 90 years old, they say, yeah, well, I've, I've done it kind of all, I've yeah. seen it all. <laughs> like, you know, there's no need for me to become like 110 or 120 or, or 200 mm. years, right? Yes. So. Long, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have one more slightly sci-fi question to ask. Stem cells, mm -hmm. we've heard a lot about, about them in the last decade or so, and they've also been put to use. It's all experimental research, the way it's put forward. Does it have anything to do with the research that you do? Um, yes and no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we are interested in the exome matrix, right, which is around the cells. And so stem cells are in the exome matrix, right? Okay. So whatever you find to 
keep that extra matrix younger, that directly impacts the stem cells to keep it, the stem cell younger. So this is okay. kind of what is shown. And the stem cell is actually used to regenerate uh, tissue, right? You mm -hmm. make new cells out of it to regenerate the parts, right? And so if you could do that for longer, right, you would imagine you could just renew your, your organ or maintain your organ for longer. And so, yes, definitely involved in aging and there are different other parts there. So if you, if you could repair, maintain, and regenerate all your tissue, yeah, you could live um, for a very long time, <laughs> <laughs> technically. You said like our environment plays a huge role in our lifespan and life quality. What are the biggest factors, what are the biggest things we can do to most affect our quality of life? Yeah, like what can we do to promote healthy living? Today. Yeah, uh, the, the example of the Okinawa is, is the right one, right? So um, eat, you know, the right stuff. I mean, I can say th it's very boring. Yeah? I'm <laughs> going to say, nutrition. yeah, yes, <laughs> exactly. Eat uh, not, not too much, do exercise, be socially active. Um, that's all the moment we but can do. But then you do. say environment plays a role as well, because the same people who held the sa that lifestyle worked in Okinawa, which is a nice tropical island, yeah. but didn't work in the United States. Yeah. So there must be some caveat somewhere. Exactly. I mean, wh what you do with the environment, you change your gene expression, right? Once you know, if you would know what triggers that, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You could mimic it with, with something, right? And then you could like, affected like i don't want to say a drug but basically you could take something that makes you healthier so for example coming back to the early example with this gene mutation in cl against this insulin hf1 receptor right and then in mouse they found it right now we have people that have um, uh, diabetes right and we have already drugs against uh, against diabetes for example right um, like metformin for example so now what people have found, if people take metformin with diabetes, they actually protect it against other age dependencies like cancer, or Alzheimer, things like that. So now in the US, they're trying to make a clinical trial and see whether that's going to be helpful for normal people just to maintain their health for longer, right? Mm. You and mentioned clinical trials. So any of the uh, works that you've done, have they been? Have they reached clinical trial stage? No, no, no not no, yet. No. You're still it's focusing on bacteria. Uh, yes, I'm still on the basic side. Yeah, I okay. mean, with going to the clinical trials, there are a couple of things that um, a little bit problematic at the moment because aging is not seen as a disease, right? Uh. right? <laughs> <laughs> and then that's the first thing, and that's why. Uh, and the second thing is like, um, how would you actually going to do about the clinical trial, right? I mean, you cannot lifespan the human. I mean, it's going <laughs> to be too long, right? So you have to find some sorts of markers, which, you know, there have been cool examples, or at least examples I like uh, that have been done with other drugs, um, where um, giving those drugs actually improved certain parameters of, of health, like vaccination against influenza, uh, influenza and things like that. So. Um, it, it's coming. We are not there yet. It's a young field, right? As yes. I said, it really hit off 1993. So it's a young field, but <laughs> we're getting there. Okay, do we have any other questions? No, that's great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. okay, so... Can I, I thank my uh, funding agencies? So the Swiss... Uh, oh yeah, sure. Science. Yes. Yes. The so research that Professor Ewald does is kindly sponsored by... Swiss National Science Foundation. Swiss National Science Foundation. And, okay, yeah, we could also talk about, you've just established your group here. Yes. And w what kind of students are you looking for, if you're looking for students and researchers? So at the moment, um, I'm kind of, my lab is filled at the moment. Okay. But, yeah. <laughs> but basically, <laughs> I always look for very creative and innovative minds. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the only requirement I have to come up with some sort of creative solution to solve a problem. So you have to be good at problem solving and you have to be good at detective work. Because science is basically all detective work <laughs> <laughs> and asking questions. <laughs> uh, does a uh, formal education background matter? Like w will a mathematician be helpful as much? Or are you sure. specifically looking for, okay. No, no, of course. I mean, if you want to go into like big data and things like oh, yeah. that and algorithms, of course you need mathematics. Mm -hmm. And you can do modeling, and you know, I mean, you can, you can go far with. 
lots of disciplines, at least yeah, with mathematics especially. Yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you, Professor Ewald, for giving us your time. This was really interesting. I'm pretty sure anyone listening to this right now did we'll get We'll live longer. <laughs> <laughs>